Today, I'm going to be teaching you how to play City of Kings. I'm Mark Maya. Welcome to Board Game Coffee. Now, at any point during this video, if you want to skip ahead in the lesson, just follow the index located in the description below. The City of Kings, an epic story on a tiny map with huge character sheets. In the City of Kings, you take on the role of a great leader who must cooperate with the other great leaders to defeat the evil armies of Vesh. Together, you'll explore the world, searching for resources to trade for cool new equipment. You'll customize your characters and create your own unique roles to become the hero you want to be, not the hero you're told to be. But tread lightly, because the creatures you discover will be fierce and plenty, so you're going to need to adapt if you want to survive. At the start of the game, you're going to choose one of seven stories, each of which are made up of multiple chapters. While you can choose any story you want to play, it's recommended that you play them in order. Now, it's important to note that even though the story of the City of Kings does carry on from one story to the next, that the gameplay experience of each story is self-contained. This means that although your hero's armor, experience, and skill points do carry on from one chapter to the next, they don't carry over from one story to the next. So when you move on from one story to the next, you'll essentially be starting from scratch. You do get some bonuses from each story setup, but that's it. If stories aren't your thing, you're not the kind of player that wants to go through a whole campaign, there are individual scenarios available that you can play. These scenarios are self-contained experiences with the rules on the front and the story on the back. But for this how to play, we're gonna focus on a story setup. So let's get back to that. To win a story, you're gonna to have to complete all the objectives listed on each chapter card. And you have until either your city runs out of hope or your heroes lose all their morale. Now, before we get into the heart of the lesson, I should explain that there's a lot of little details about the City of Kings that we won't be covering in this video, but that's on purpose. Allow me to explain. Throughout your adventure, you're gonna be discovering new locations and coming across new creatures with different ability combinations. And when that happens, and it will happen, you're gonna be asking yourself, what is that? What do these do? Where am I? And that's where the reference guide comes into play. Unlike other games, the reference guide in City of Kings quickly becomes a necessity. It's your lifeline to knowledge. So when you do come across something you don't understand, you can get a full breakdown of it in the reference guide. The idea of referencing something you don't understand plays well into the theme of the City of Kings. You and your band of heroes are venturing out into the world to face the unknown. And in this case, you really are. So the more you explore and discover new things in your surroundings, the more you grow as adventurers. As not to spoil your journey of discovery, we're just gonna teach you what you need to know to get started. The reference guide will guide you through the rest. Now, there are a lot of components that you're gonna to wanna to hunch out and sort out before we even attempt our first setup. And fair warning, it's gonna take a while. While you're sorting through your punch outs, take your creature ability tokens, these things with the colored shapes on the back, and place them in the bags of the matching color. The abilities with the green circle on the back go in the green easy bag. The yellow triangle abilities go in the yellow medium bag. And the abilities with the red squares go in the red hard bag. Any blank ability tiles you come across, you can put aside. We won't be using these today. But you can include these in future play sessions if you want to create your own creature abilities. After you're done with that, you're going to want to assemble all your character and war banner standees and attach the spinner to the time tracker. All right, now that that's all done, let's get down to the setup. First thing you're going to want to do is select your hero sheets. Each player decides which hero they want to play and takes that hero's corresponding sheet. Once that's done, place all remaining hero sheets back in the box. Set your hero sheet in front of you. This is who you are now. Once you've got your sheet in place, collect your hero's matching character standee, 10 stat cubes, 12 skill tokens, 5 action tokens, and 2 worker tokens. Oh, and you'll also need one red cube. Place your hero standee and one worker token aside for now. We'll be placing those a little later in the video. Your second worker token will be placed here in this space matching the worker's image. You'll also place one of your 5 action tokens here with your worker. When you unlock this second worker, you'll earn that fifth action token. For now, you only start with four. We'll go over unlocking your worker and gaining that fifth token a little later. Place your remaining four action tokens in this area. You'll be using those a lot once the game starts. Your 12 skill tokens can also be placed nearby for easy access, but you won't be using those nearly as much. Now, out of your 10 stack cubes, you're only gonna place nine. The 10th is just a spare. 
A large portion of your hero sheet is dedicated to tracking their stats. How much health they have, how much attack they do, and how fast they move, etc. Hero stats will change throughout the game, either when you gain XP or buy cool new equipment. But until that happens, every hero starts with the same stat values. So, to start, place the 9 stat cubes in the following slots. Set your max health to 4, attack to 1, healing to 1, range to lower 1, which is the first number 1 that appears on the track, your move to lower 2, and your luck to 0. Now take that one red cube and place it under your max health stat. While the purple cube represents your hero's max health, this red cube indicates your hero's current health. So when you take damage, this is the one you'll move. Now we move on to our worker stats. Worker stats function like hero stats, there's just less of them. So set your worker's movement to 1, their gather to 1, and their scavenge to 1. Workers don't have a health stat since they don't take damage. Lucky them. Now that we have our stats in place, let's see what adventures await our heroes. Yeah. This is the part where we pick our story. For this example, we're going to start at the beginning with story 1. First blood. Brr. Each story has its own setup card. This card will tell you everything you need to know to, um, well, set up. Now, instinctively, you're going to want to start at step 1. Makes sense, right? But no. When setting up for a story, I actually find it a lot easier to start at step 3, the board setup. This will give you a better sense of what kind of table space you're working with. To set up the board, all you gotta do is lay out the green and red tiles in the pattern shown here. For this map, you'll need to gather all the tiles indicated with the numbers 1, 2, and 3. These numbers are indicated on the bottom corner of each tile. Once you've collected all the tiles, it's time to build your map. Grab your City of Kings corner tile and lay it down right about here. Next, you're going to want to look through your tiles and pull out the ones named here on your setup card. In this case, we're looking for the Tower of the North Wind and the Oak Wood. These tiles will be placed in their designated areas shown here. A for the Tower of the North Wind and B for the Oak Wood. Keep those name tiles nearby. You'll need them soon enough. Now, take all your green tiles, shuffle them up, and lay them face down on the table, starting from the corner tile and working your way out, following the pattern indicated on the setup card. When you get to the areas indicated with the letter, place the name tile in that spot. Now do the same thing with the red tiles. Ta-da! We have a board. Now, we go back to the top of the setup card. Step 1 will determine how much hope, time, and morale we start with based on the number of players we have. For this example, let's say we're playing with 2 players. In which case, we would set our hope to 2, our morale to 3, and our time to midnight. Next, we set up our hero and creature stats. For this story, your XP starts at zero. But not to worry, it will increase as you complete quests and kill things. For your first story, your hero doesn't receive any additional stat or skill points, although they have their base stats that we set up in the start. If there was additional stats or skill points listed, you would simply increase your stats by that amount. So, if the setup card read, stat 2, you would increase any two of your hero's stats by one, or any one stat by two. This number here indicates how many equipment cards will be added face up to the trade district. So in this case, we don't add any. And this here is the starting level of creature stat bars. What are creature stat bars, you ask? Let me show you. These little stat bars will determine what kind of creatures you'll be fighting. You'll notice a big number printed on the back of each bar, and these symbols that indicate the player count. For our two-player example, we're only going to be using the bars with the two-player symbols on the back. You can place all the bars with the three and four-player symbols back in the box. We won't be needing those for this game. Now that you're down to one set of stat bars, you're going to want to make sure that they're stacked in order, 
with the number 1 bar at the top of the stack, followed by 2, and so on. But if it read creature stat bar 6, we would start with 6 as the first bar on top of the stack, and put the others away. This will happen in later stories, since higher numbers generally mean tougher creatures. We've already done step 3, board setup, so let's move on to step 4, starting locations. This step simply tells you where your characters are going to start. In this case, our heroes start in the City of Kings. Each player places their hero and one worker on the City of Kings tile. You won't be needing your setup card anymore, so you can set that aside. Now take your story cards and set them up next to the board. You'll also want to take your old barn and time tracker and place them somewhere where everyone can see. Then take your gather, chance, and scavenge dice and place them within easy reach of all players. Now take all those other tokens you punched out earlier and organize them in a way that allows you easy access while you're playing. For this video, I'll be using the trays supplied with the Kickstarter Deluxe Edition. Next. Set up the areas that you'll be using for your trade district, quest hub, and temple. Throughout the game, you'll be placing cards both above and below these headers, so make sure you leave yourself enough room. Now, shuffle up your position cards, your equipment cards, quest cards, and skill cards. Your equipment cards can be placed next to the trade district, your quest cards next to the quest hub, and your skill cards next to your temple. In addition, take the top four cards of the temple deck and place them face up under the temple header. The position cards can be placed anywhere that is easily accessible by all players. Next, we set up our creature supply. Start with the creature templates. Which order you stack them doesn't matter as long as they're separate from the boss templates. It's easy to tell the difference because boss templates have a picture of the boss rather than just a banner image and they also have an ability printed right onto their template, which regular creatures do not. Next, take the creature stat bars that we looked at earlier and place them next to the creature and boss templates. The stack of stat bars for the regular creatures can get quite high, so feel free to separate them into two separate piles so you don't knock them over as easy. Put the creature banners, boss standees, and red health cubes nearby for easy access. Remember those ability bags that we loaded up at the start? Well, you'll be dipping your hand in and out of those quite frequently, so make sure they're close by. Okay, that was a lot of setup, but now that the board is ready, let's get down to the learning. First thing we're going to go over is all the actions your hero can do. Each player has four actions they can perform a turn, which are tracked with these tokens. Whenever you perform an action, such as move or explore, simply add a token to that action. Actions don't have to be performed in any particular order, and you do not have to use all of them on your turn if you don't want to. You might have noticed that some actions have one token slot while others have two. Simply put, an action that has two slots next to it can be performed twice. The actions you can perform are move. This allows your hero to move up to its maximum move value, which in this case is two, as shown here. Characters can only move vertically or horizontally along these tiles. They can even turn corners, but they cannot move diagonally. In addition, heroes are not allowed to move from one unexplored tile to another unexplored tile, but they can move from an unexplored tile to an explored tile. Player movement isn't impeded by creatures, so you can move on, off, or through a tile with a creature on it. Our next action is Explore. Exploring simply means to flip over a face down tile that you are currently standing on. If the tile is a creature tile, generate a creature, place its banner on that tile, and place that creature's template next to the hero sheet of the player who performed the Explore action. Creature templates determine how strong a creature is and what abilities it has, and it's all randomly generated by you. Later in the video, I'll explain how to generate a creature, but for now, let's go back to our hero's explore action. If the tile you explored ended up being a shop, immediately place three cards from the equipment deck face up under the trade district. These cards are now available for purchase. More on that coming up shortly. If the tile you explored was a quest tile, 
immediately take one quest from the top of the quest deck. But if it was your worker that found that quest tile, do not draw a quest. More on both workers and quests a little later. On your adventure, you're going to come across other tiles that do other things. When you do, simply refer to the reference guide for a quick explanation. Next, we have attack and heal. This doesn't mean you get to attack and heal. It just means that if you're targeting a creature, it's an attack. If you're targeting a hero, it's a heal. To attack, you're first going to need to figure out if the creature is within range of your hero. Range is determined by the attacking hero's range value. In this case, two. This means that the hero can attack a creature up to two tiles away in a straight line, either horizontally or vertically, never diagonally. Once you've determined that the target you're attacking is within range, apply that hero's attack to the creature. And since our hero's attack is three, the creature takes three damage. If you want to spend your action to heal a player instead of attack a creature, the steps are very similar. Check if you have range on the other character you want to heal, and heal them an amount equal to your heal stat. In this case, our heal is at one. Not a whole lot. If you ever want to heal yourself, you don't need to check for range. A hero can never be healed beyond their max health. So, if you're down by two health, but get healed for five, you're only going to heal your max amount. Now, on to special actions. At the start of the game, this action doesn't actually have a use, but as you play through the City of Kings, you'll unlock special abilities that will require a special action to perform. But since those abilities are so varied, you're better off referring to the guidebook as you unlock them. And finally, interact, the last of our available hero actions. There are certain tiles on the map that a hero can interact with, the quest tile being one of them. When you perform an interact action on a quest tile, Simply take a quest from the top of the quest deck and read it out loud. The objective for that quest and the reward for completing it are listed here. At the bottom of the card, it will indicate if this quest is for a group or an individual. The individual being the one who triggered the quest. Quest objectives are pretty self-explanatory. And as always, if you have any questions, simply refer to the quest type in the reference guide. If the quest is meant for a group, place it in the quest area. If it's an individual quest, place it near the person who triggered it. Another tile you can interact with is the shop. When on a shop tile, or on the City of King's corner tile, players can perform an interact action to purchase equipment from the trade district. The player performing the interaction can buy as many cards as they can afford during this time. The price of equipment is listed here. This serpent scale, for example, costs one wood, one fish, and one ore. To buy it, simply subtract the cost of the item from the resources collected in the barn. Then take the card and place it in the appropriate slot on your hero sheet. Leg armor goes in the leg slot, body armor in the body slot, and so on. You can't have more than one type of the same equipment. So if you want to buy that new body armor, you're going to have to discard your old body armor. You can't save it for later. Although, if you happen to be on the City of King's tile with another player, you can perform an interact action to trade as much equipment as you want between you and the other player. Any new equipment gained this way will still need to be placed in the proper slot on the character sheet. Although it is fun to buy armor for your character, there are some limiting factors that you should be aware of. If you look here on your hero stats, you'll notice this little picture of a helmet. That's the head icon. What this means is, if your hero wants to wear a helmet, or anything else that might sit on their head slot, they're going to need at least one cube from any of these stats to reach the helmet line. Same goes for the arms slot, these two little cross swords you see here. Except for arms, you're going to need at least one stat at the arms line before you can equip any arms cards. Whenever you add a new piece of equipment, remember to increase your hero's stats to reflect the benefits listed on that card. It's also important to remember to reduce your stats at the moment any armor is removed. Because if removing equipment reduces your stats to the point that you no longer have a cube that reaches the helmet line, then you can't equip that shiny new helmet you just bought. The last tile we'll go over is the stable tile. By performing an interact action on the stable tile, you can instantly move your hero to another stable tile 
or directly into the City of Kings. Now that you understand everything your hero can do, let's move on to your workers. Each hero has their own worker that they can move around the board, explore tiles, and use to gather resources for the barn. And that's how you'll be able to buy cool stuff. Workers only have three actions they can perform, and they share the same action tokens that your heroes use. So when I said that your hero has four actions, I really meant that your hero and worker have four actions that they share. But you can divide those actions up any way you want. Out of the three actions a worker can perform, two are the same as your hero. Workers follow the same movement rules as your hero, although by default their move stat starts at 1, so they're not very fast. But they can move twice in one turn, which can come in handy. The explore action also works the same way, with the exception that when a worker finds a quest tile, they don't trigger a quest. Although, heroes can still interact with this quest tile as normal to draw a new quest. And yes, workers can still trigger creatures. If they do, that creature's template is still set next to that player's hero sheet. The last action available to our worker is the work action. Only workers can work, and working is really important if you want to survive. And buy cool stuff. When a worker is on a resource tile, they can perform a work action to gather resources. There are two different types of resource tiles. Gather tiles, indicated by this blue hammer, and scavenge tiles, indicated by this brown sack. When working a gather tile, roll blue dice equal to that worker's gather stat. The total number of hammers on the dice determine how much of that tile's resources you'll get. The resource supplied by that tile is indicated next to the hammer icon. In the case of the scavenge tile, roll a number of brown dice equal to your worker's scavenge stat. Unlike the blue gather dice, the scavenge dice only have one image per side, and you only get one of whatever you roll, unless you roll more dice. Although you get less, the advantage with the scavenge dice is that you're not limited to one type of resource. When you've rolled either of the resource dice, take the resources you've earned from the supply pile and add them to your worker space on your hero sheet. Your worker can only collect six resources at a time, so you'll want to deposit them in the old barn before you collect any more. To deposit your resources, simply move your worker into the City of Kings tile. Once there, your worker's resources are automatically returned to the supply pile and recorded on the barn tile. Resources in the barn are shared by all players, and resources still being carried by your workers cannot be used until they are deposited into the barn. And that's how you gather resources. But there was that one other symbol on the die. While rolling for resources, you might turn up these creepy looking eyes. When that happens, add an attention token to the tile your worker is on. These tokens mean that while your worker was out there gathering and scavenging, they managed to catch the attention of one of the nearby creatures. If you ever place a fourth token on the tile, remove the tokens, generate a monster, and place the banner on that worker's tile. The worker is now considered trapped and cannot do anything. Let's go back into the city for a minute. While in the City of Kings, your workers can also perform a work action to procure any of these four items listed here. They can spend three item parts, these little axe-shaped things, to add a new equipment card to the trade district, or they can spend eight ore, fish, or wood to pick one of these temporary structures. When a worker performs an action to purchase any of these structures, the structure is placed over their worker space. While carrying a temporary structure, workers cannot carry anything else. They'll have to place structures down before they can carry any more resources. When on a tile, workers can use a work action to place the temporary structure on that tile. Once placed, these temporary structures can be used by any hero without spending an action at any time, even on another player's turn or during a creature's turn. When you use a temporary structure, remove it from the map and return it to the supply. The camp structure will instantly restore health to one hero standing on the same tile as the camp. The amount of the health restored is equal to the current level indicated on the XP tracker. 
Any one hero standing on the same tile as the barricades can remove it to prevent an amount of damage equal to their current level. The trap is the only structure that does not require the hero to be standing on the same tile to trigger it. As long as a creature is standing on the trap, any hero can trigger it at any time, dealing damage to the creature equal to the current level. Now that you know everything your workers can do, there's something else you should know. One big disadvantage to worker actions are creatures. Unlike your hero, if a worker is on a tile with a creature, they can't perform any actions at all, not even move. But they won't get killed either, so there's that. Oh, and that second worker and fifth action you've been waiting to unlock? If you increase any one of your worker's stats to four, you unlock your second worker and the fifth action. Very exciting. We've talked quite a bit about increasing stats, but you're probably wondering, how do we do that exactly? This is your experience track, or XP track for short. As you play through the City of Kings, you earn XP by completing quests and killing creatures. The amount of XP earned from killing a creature is listed at the end of their stat bar. And the amount earned from a quest or completing a chapter will be listed on the bottom of that card. All XP is shared, even if it's earned from an individual quest. Track all XP you've earned, no matter by who, on the XP track. Each time you pass over one of these spaces with this green little cube icon, each player gets to increase one of their stats by one. This can either be spent on your worker or your hero. When you pass over this orange disc icon, you earn a skill point, which can be applied to your skill tree, which also increases your stats, but can also unlock new abilities for your hero. We'll get back to this whole skill tree thing later in the video. When you pass over this combo image, you earn one of each, one stat and one skill. So now that you get a good idea of how XP works, let's talk a little bit about creatures because a lot of the XP you're gonna gain in City of Kings will be earned by killing creatures. But before you learn how to kill a creature, you're gonna to need to learn how to make a creature. Creatures will appear throughout your adventure as you explore new tiles. And the coolest part about that is they're all different. And why? That's because you're generating all these creatures randomly. First, we're gonna go over all the components that you need to make a creature. Then I'll teach you how to make a creature and what it all means. These color-coded tokens here are creature abilities. There are over 50 different creature abilities in the City of Kings, so we're not going to go over all of them here. When you do come across a new creature ability, simply look it up in the quick reference guide. It'll tell you everything you need to know. I recommend looking up a new ability as soon as you encounter it, since some abilities trigger when you draw them and others trigger when the creature is attacked. Either way, you're going to want to be prepared. Creature abilities come in three levels of difficulty. Easy, medium, and hard. Your typical creature will have a basic attack and some form of defense, like healing. But one important thing to note is that creatures can't move unless they have an ability that allows them to do so. Okay, let's go back to the table. When you encounter one of these creatures on your adventure, you need to generate what kind of creature it actually is. And doing so is pretty easy. First, take a creature template off the top of the stack. Then, Grab a creature stat bar from the top of that stack. Flip it over and place it directly under your creature template. This stat bar will tell you everything you need to know to generate this new creature. First, set the creature's health to 15 as indicated on the stat bar. This next area indicates how many abilities the creature has and their difficulty level. So in this example, this creature has two abilities one green and one yellow. For the first ability, we're going to reach into the green easy bag and pull one out at random, lightning bolt. Notice the matching symbol. Once we've pulled an ability, place it on the creature template. For the second ability, we're going to reach into the yellow medium bag. Let's see what we get. You'll notice that the yellow abilities actually have two abilities on one token. In this case, fireball and poison spit. If you ever pull out two of the same abilities when generating a creature, simply stack them on top of each other. These abilities will only trigger once when a creature attacks. Some quests might require that you generate a creature, and these quests might include creature abilities of their own. In this case, these abilities would be in addition to the abilities already added to the creature. Another way additional abilities can be added to a creature 
is if you explore a creature tile that has ability symbols printed on it. In this case, the creature would receive one additional easy ability. Now that we have our creature abilities loaded on the card, this creature is ready to go. The only thing left to do is take the creature's matching banner from the supply and place it on the tile where it was discovered, unless you're told otherwise by a quest or story setup. When you do find a creature, place its generated template and stat bar next to the sheet of the hero who triggered that creature. If the same hero manages to trigger a second creature, place the second creature's template in front of the first. On that player's turn, during the creature's activation phase, the newest creature will be the first to attack. More on phases a little later. Aside from their randomly generated abilities, all creatures have a base set of skills listed on their stat bar. This tells you how much armor a creature has. One armor would mean that this creature will block one point of your hero's attack. This tells you how much the creature heals at the start of its turn. But neither creature nor hero can heal beyond their max health. The single sword icon shows you how much damage this creature deals to a single target within range. And the multi sword icon shows you how much damage it deals to all targets within range, including the one that got hit from its first initial target. This is where we see the creature's range, which works the same as our hero's range that we covered earlier. But since a creature can't tell you who they want to attack, there are a few targeting rules to follow when selecting a target for a creature. Which leads us to priority targeting. If there are two heroes within a creature's range, the creature will attack the closest. Unless, of course, it's an attack all situation, in which case both would get attacked. If both heroes are equal distance away from the creature, then the hero with the highest max health takes the hit. Remember, max health not current health. Now, if both heroes are at an equal distance away and both have the same max health, then the target is the hero who has the creature's template next to their sheet. Earlier in the video, we discussed how a hero spends an action to perform an attack against a creature. That was an example of a basic attack and a heal action. But there are a few other things to keep in mind when attacking a creature or healing a hero, such as luck. By default, a hero's luck starts at zero. You'll have to upgrade it if you want to benefit from it. So let's say, for example, you did, and your hero's luck is at three. That would mean, when you attack or heal, you would roll three luck dice, take the best result, and add it to your attack total. You don't get to keep them all. That would be overkill. There are four possible outcomes on a luck die. Add plus one to your attack, add plus two to your attack, add nothing to your attack, or increase your attack by 50%. Note that any time you're asked to add or subtract 50% from anything, always round up. When you roll luck for a heal action, it works the same way, except you're adding the bonus to the amount that you heal to a hero, rather than the damage you deal to a creature. Since you get to roll the luck dice every time you attack or heal, it's a pretty good investment in my book. But it's not all luck and bonuses when you're attacking a creature, because there are some negative effects you're going to have to take into account. Such as, if a creature has a shield, you'll need to deduct that amount from your total attack value. Some creatures have defensive abilities that trigger when attacked, indicated by this little shield icon. I'm not exactly sure what they all do, but that's where the reference book comes into play. But whatever it is, I'm sure it's bad news. Some creature stat bars have this reflect damage icon, which means every time this creature is attacked, the hero who attacked it gets damaged by the indicated amount. In this case, two. So if you attack this creature twice, you'll be taking four damage. And that's a lot. Until now, I've been focusing on teaching you the most important aspects of the City of Kings gameplay. The basic knowledge you need to move forward. But the order in which the gameplay plays out is a little bit different. The list here lays out the order of play and separates it into two sections, the round summary and player turn. You only have to run down the round summary list at the start of each round, not the start of each player turn. I found it easiest to think of the round summary as part of the first player's turn. That way when their turn comes around, they can be the ones that remind us to resolve the story and move the timer. Once the round summary is done, each player takes a turn running through their steps listed under player turn. Once they've all had their chance to do so, we start back at the round summary. On the very first round of gameplay, 
Instead of checking if the story is resolved, which it won't be, simply read the story and the objective out loud. At the start of every subsequent turn, simply check if you've achieved that chapter's objective. If you have, congratulations, move on to the next chapter. If you haven't, then move on to the next step. Move Time Tracker. As rounds go by, the time tracker ticks down, and every time it reaches midnight, the people of the city lose hope and we're one step closer to failure. On the time tracker, you'll notice these little symbols on each segment. Ice, fire, and poison. Moving the timer into these segments represents the effects of the passage of time on those elements in the environment. So, when you turn the spinner to ice, ice begins to melt. Fire starts to fade, and poison clouds dissipate. But what does that look like? Let me show you. Many effects in the game will require that you place these fire, frost, or poison tokens on a particular tile. When you do, it'll either be a strong version or a weak version, depicted on the other side as a smaller image. Each time the timer reaches one of these symbols, reduce the effects of that element by one. All strong fires would be reduced to weak fires. All weak fires would be removed from the board. Same goes for frost and poison. Remember these attention tokens that our workers caused earlier? Well, when the timer hits midnight, attention tokens start to fade as well. But instead of flipping them over or making them weaker, you simply remove one attention token from each of the tiles that has one on it. And remember, the time tracker only moves at the start of each round, not each player's turn. Now we reach the player turn. At this point, players will each take a turn performing the steps listed here. Step one, resolve impairments. This is the part where things start to hurt. If you're standing on a tile with a fire token on it, your hero takes damage. One damage if it's a weak fire, and two damage if it's a strong fire. If your hero has been poisoned, as indicated by a poison marker on their character sheet, then they will take damage for that as well. And just like fire, they'll take one damage for a weak poison and two damage for strong poison. Note that if your hero is standing on a tile when it catches fire, they will take damage immediately. In the case of poison, the poison is added to your hero's sheet, but you do not take damage until the poison starts to kick in at the start of the next Resolve Impairment stage. Step two, activate creatures. If you have no creatures next to your hero sheet, you can simply skip this step and move on to the next one. But if you do, that creature is activated. This means that any creature you've discovered will activate before your hero gets a chance to do anything. But that won't happen on the turn that the creature is found, since your hero's turn has already started. When a creature does activate, first resolve any impairments on that creature, such as dealing damage due to poison or fire. Once you're done with that, trigger each of the creature's abilities one at a time, starting with the ability that has the lowest number printed on it. Refer to the reference book to see what each ability does. Once you've run through all the special abilities, trigger the creature's basic abilities. If the creature has healing, indicated by this green cross, then heal it by the number shown. The creature then performs a basic attack against a single priority target. Then, if listed, the creature performs an attack all. If you are unfortunate enough to have more than one creature template lined up by your hero sheet, all of those creatures get to activate before your hero gets a turn to do anything. The fact that you have a creature template, or multiple creature templates, lined up by your hero sheet doesn't necessarily mean they're going to attack you. All that does mean is that those creatures are going to go before you go. Although, as I mentioned earlier during priority targeting, if you and the other player are equal distance away from the creature when they are choosing a target, and your max health and their max health are the same, then the creature is going to choose whichever hero that their template is next to. At any point during your adventure, if your hero's current health drops below one, either from a creature attack, poison, or just spending too much time staying in a fire, whatever the case, that hero is considered to have taken critical damage. When that happens, immediately place the hero in the City of Kings. Restore the current health to full, 
and remove any impairments they might have on them. Any unused actions they might still have can still be spent. Taking critical damage does not mean your turn is over. So when you think about it, dying's not all that bad. Well, almost. When a hero takes critical damage, lower morale by one. If morale ever reaches zero, you lose. I take it back, dying's not all that great. But when a creature dies, now there's a death I can get behind. First thing you're gonna to wanna to do when a creature dies is check if it had any last minute tricks up its sleeve, like any abilities that trigger when it dies, indicated by this skull. For this example, let's say it didn't. Now check how much XP the creature was worth and add that XP to the XP track. Then take that creature's banner off the board and place it in the supply pile, along with its health cubes. Place the creature's template on the bottom of the template pile and toss the stat bar into the stat bar discard pile. Any abilities that the creature had on its template are returned to their appropriate colored bags. You wanna know the greatest thing about the City of Kings tile? I'm gonna tell you. When a hero steps into the City of Kings, they are automatically restored to full health and all impairments such as poisoned are removed from their character sheets. So you don't have to take critical damage before you benefit from the magic healing powers of the city. And when your hero is in the city, they can't be attacked by creatures, nor can they attack creatures. And creatures can't move onto the city. Once all creatures next to your sheet have had their turn, we move on to the next step, hero and worker actions. This is where you get to take all those different actions that we talked about earlier in the video. So since we've already covered all those actions, let's move on to something that we only touched on briefly earlier in the video. The skill tree. Remember those little discs we got when we earned XP? Well, whenever you earn one of those little discs, you get to place it on a slot in the skill tree. If you place it on one of these symbols, which you'll recognize immediately as your stat symbols, increase that stat by one. If you place a disc in one of the more wordy spaces, you've unlocked a new skill. What that skill does will be written right there, and they're pretty self-explanatory. If a skill has the word passive at the bottom, it's always active. You don't have to do anything to activate it. If it reads special, you'll need to perform a special action to activate it. Anytime skills can be performed anytime, not just on your turn. But you still have to spend an action and have the appropriate action slot available to pull it off. And remember, you only get your action tokens back at the start of your turn. So if you plan on healing a fellow hero when it's not your turn, you're gonna to need to plan ahead and save yourself some action tokens to do it. Transform skills also require a special action and a modification to your hero sheet. For example, Vengeful Prayer says that you can no longer move, which is not so great, but your basic attack is increased by 50%, which is pretty cool. To indicate your lack of mobility, place one of these X markers over your move action. Your hero can't move as long as this X is here. To reverse the transformation, simply perform the skill again by using a special action on a future turn. Your hero will regain their movement, but lose the damage bonus. Although you can customize your skill tree to best fit your playstyle, your first skill point must be spent on one of these three range skills. And any additional skill points you earn from this point on can only be placed on skills that are adjacent to a previously placed skill that is attached by these lines. So, if your first skill point was spent here, you can place your second skill point here, here, or here. But you can't place it here, because this space isn't adjacent to a previously placed skill. The skill tree is broken up into three tiers. To move up to the next tier, you'll need to build up to it. For example, if you had two skills placed here, and you wanted to place a third in the next tier, you would need to select one of the four available skill tiles from the temple, place it on the next tier, and then place your skill token. Whenever you do take a skill card from the temple, remember to replace it with a new one right away. The last note on the skill tree is, as you make your way up the tree, you can only select one of these four skills per tier. So one of these four, one of these four, and one of these four. And you can't just change them up when you feel like it, so choose wisely. Oh right, I almost forgot about these. 
Position cards are used whenever a hero or creature has to be moved around the board randomly. Let me show you. Say a creature has a move ability. To figure out where it moves to, draw a position card and make sure it's oriented in the right direction. Next, follow the directional line to the number 1. X is the creature's current location. In cases where the path to 1 takes the creature off the board, or causes it to stop inside the City of Kings, move on to the next path. Stop when you find a path that works, and move the creature to that legal space. Unlike heroes, creatures can move over any number of unexplored tiles. Once you move the creature, place the position card on the bottom of the deck. When performing a random move on a hero, usually brought on by the result of a creature ability, follow the same steps as you did with the creature, except now the hero is represented by the X. And last but not least, bosses and the Scorched. There are a variety of different bosses in the City of Kings, and for the most part, they function just like creatures, with these few exceptions. Bosses have their own boss stat tile. So when generating a boss, pull from the boss stack of the stat tiles. Bosses also have an ability printed right on their template, which can be referenced in the reference book just like any other ability. Bosses also have their very own standee, rather than the simple looking rectangular banners used by creatures. The Scorched is a special character that cannot be attacked or killed. When you are told to place the Scorched on the map, do not give it a stat bar or any extra abilities. During its activation phase, the Scorched will use its special ability, Fire Trail. Basically, they run around the board setting everything on fire. Alright, and that's it. You are now experts at everything you need to know about the City of Kings. Okay, maybe not experts, but I hope the video helped. Oh, and if you find the game too hard or you're looking for a solo experience, there's instructions to do both in the back of the rulebook. So, thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Maya. This is Board Game Coffee. If you like the video and you want to keep up to date on what we're doing, subscribe here. If you want to see more videos right now, head to our channel here. And if you're on Instagram, follow us at Board Game Coffee. We're posting on there daily and we'd love to chat. Thanks again.